Hi, welcome to Exploring Illusion Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today our topic is free will versus universal will belief, uh, the new intelligence slash morality test. And this should be a fun show. Um, ordinarily, I go through the purpose of the show and a brief definition of free will and explanation. Um, I'll, I'll do this very, very briefly. The purpose of the show is to create a better world because the, the belief in free will causes unnecessary blame, arrogance, envy, um, you know, it's guilt. And to the extent that we overcome it, we create a better world for everyone. Okay. And basically when I say free will is like what we generally mean when we say free will. There's common agreement generally among people when we use this term that um, the term means that we would be able to choose whatever we want, you know, regardless of anything, regardless of how we were raised, what we learned, our genetic makeup, you know, what's going on in our unconscious, we have, which we have no, you know, access to. And clearly that's, you know, that's impossible for two reasons. One, um, causality. If everything has a cause, then every one of our decisions or choices or thoughts or feelings or everything we do has a cause, and there's a cause to that, and there's a cause to that. So this cause and effect chain would, um, would mean that what we're doing now is the direct result of what happened before we were born. You know, because again, each cause precedes the its effect, and it goes back in time. So you have causes going back in time. Okay, so that's um, that's good for that. All right, so now this is what I'm proposing is a new kind of intelligence morality test because the kind of intelligence morality tests that um, they use. I've got you know a couple of friends of mine. They're both Menzas. They're not all that sharp on logic. I mean, they, they one of them gets this. Um, you know, the free will is an illusion. The other, other one doesn't, you know. And we're going to get into uh, why that is. Okay, so, so yeah, basically, I mean, I'm not saying that the other kinds of intelligence morality tests aren't, you know, useful for other purposes. But if you're testing, if you want to test basic logic, basic reasoning, you know, and if you want to test basic reasoning as it applies to morality, then this, this is a test that um, I think should enlighten a lot of people. Okay, so um, the, the test is actually, you know, if the test is like, you know, does a person understand that because everything has a cause, free will is impossible? That's the test. It's a simple test. Um, if a person understands that, then um, their logic is working. You know, I think this is just like a pass-fail. I, I don't know if they're, you know, yeah, well, this is like, there's no degrees of this. Um, you either understand it or you don't. And, um, and so, yeah, so like if somebody gets it, that like, you know, if everything that happens has a cause and every one of our decisions must have a cause and that makes free will impossible. So if you get that, you know, you got this. Okay, um, and then there, we have the similar test for morality. Um, what happens, there's a lot of philosophers that say, like the philosophers, scientists, there's this guy, um, what's his name, Michael Gazzaniga, who, who, um, who refers to himself as the father of cognitive neuroscience. He just came out with a book um, refuting, um, well, refuting, <laughs> no, he, with his book, um, what is this called? Um, oh, it just came out recently. I'm trying to, oh, who's in control, I think, or who's in charge? And so, like, the curious thing about this book is, like, he starts out saying, yes, everything has a cause. You know, everything has a cause. He's not disputing determinism. He's not disputing causality. But then he still says, yes, everything has a cause, but we're still morally responsible for everything we do. Okay, he passes the first part of the, the test, but then he fails because if he really understood the ramifications, the implications of everything having a cause, then he'd realize that no, we are not quote unquote morally responsible for anything because if nothing is up to us, how could we be morally responsible? 
um, a good way to understand this, I mean, well, that's a simple way to understand this. Like, if, if well, I'm, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to think of an example. Let's say, um, let's say, um, oh. All right, no, no. <laughs> I don't, for whatever reason, I don't want to go with an example on this. Basically, it's just the idea that, like, if um, if everything is caused, if everything is causal, if the universe is causal, if all our behavior is causal, then that means that it's not up to us. That means that things that were happening before we're born are completely determining everything that's happening now. So if we make a moral decision now, it's got to be based completely, um, not just based, it's got to be the exact complete result of, of this chain of causality that, you know, again, stretches that to before we were born. Okay, and so like, so now you can see that like, you can't say, you know, it's, it's illogical, it's getting it wrong to say, yes, determinism is true, but we're still morally responsible. What you can say is like, fine, determinism is true, we don't have a free will, but we can kind of like, we have to quote unquote assume responsibility or quote unquote unquote, act as if we're responsible. But that's, I want to explain the difference. Like, you know, to me personally, it seems that like when I do things that are moral or right, it seems like the universe rewards me in some way, you know, pleasure. Um, this guy, John Locke, he's a British philosopher, he would define goodness as that which creates happiness. So, so in my experience, you know, when I do something good or right or moral, the universe rewards me with happiness or pleasure or whatever. Um, when I do something wrong, I tend to be punished. That's, so, like, so I get this. So in other words, like, I don't say to myself, well, I don't have a free will, so that means I can do whatever I want, I can say whatever I want, because I understand that even though I don't have a free will, this, I am like, you know, the universe makes me do stuff, <laughs> you know, that it will reward or punish me for. Um, okay. Um, but it's, it's um, all right, so like, uh, how, how do you explain this? I got 20 minutes. Okay. Now, if, um, can, you, can you see how, like, if everything has a cause, then we, we can't be morally responsible? So, Gazzaniga, what we're saying, like, you know, if you get the determinism right, you can't get the, the morality wrong. You know, um, you know in other words, if, if everything's predetermined, if everything's causal, there is no personal morality. You can't blame yourself. Oh, what I want to say before is the, the, the um, the utility of understanding this is like fine. We we assume personal responsibility in a sense, but when we when we do what's wrong, because like we are we don't have a free will. If we if we had a free will, we'd be doing right all the time. So when we when we or others do what's wrong, we will not blame ourselves or others. We will not blame others for 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 whatever. Um, and that's the key. We might want to blame the universe, you know, but we won't blame um, ourselves because, you know, there wouldn't be a personal morality. There'd be a, a universal morality. Okay. Um, I think you got that. Um, um, all right. I want to I wanna kind of like go a bit more into explaining why some of these like otherwise brilliant, I mean, you know, Warner Heisenberg, uh, Niels Bohr, these guys are sharp, sharp people. You know, they got this wrong. Um, why, why this happens? Okay. One reason it might happen for, for some thinkers is that um, we're hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. We can't help but do that, and that's incidentally one reason why we don't have a free will. But that actually is what I think causes many people to to not be able to get it. You've got this, this, um, this, more, this hedonic imperative. You, you want to seek pleasure. And like what happens to a lot of people, people, um, thinkers will say to themselves, well, all right, I get that, um, that causality makes free will impossible. 
But you see, I, I like feeling responsible for what I do. I like taking credit for what I do. You know, I like, and, and so, like, so, so because of that, that, that preference for personal accountability, for, for, for like feeling responsible for what we do, it overrides the reason. You know, it hijacks the reasoning process. You've got such a strong desire to be in control, to be in charge, then um, the reason of why you're not in charge w would evade. Um, and I think another, another reason has to be religious. Um, free will is a, is a um, religious concept. It was coined by St. Augustine and um, and basically, in a lot of religions, you know, they um, they have the the idea that there's like, you know, when we die, you know, we can go to either heaven or hell, you know, a good place or a bad place. And they need, you know, in order to like threaten people with that, <laughs> you know, to have that belief, you have to have free will because otherwise, it it, w it would make no sense to, well, especially with the, with the hell, <laughs> with the punishment, it would make no sense to punish someone eternally for something that was completely not in their control. Okay, that, that's very uh, common. So, so what happens is like a lot of these scientists, you know, they went to church and they went to synagogue and they went to mosque. They were raised religiously, many of them, most of them. And so you've got this conditioning that's happening for years as they're growing up that like, well, you know, be a scientist, get the science right. But listen, um, we've got some religious beliefs and if you don't believe them, then you're at risk for eternal damnation or some kind of punishment from God. So, so you've got this conditioning. You've got a lot of people saying, well, you know, it's, it's again, it's another version of the hedonic imperative. Like they're saying to themselves, well, you know, it makes sense for me to believe this because, because you know, not because it's right, because it would, it would, you know, presumably lead to a better outcome for me or for others, whatever. But again, it's conditioned. If, if we're raised to like believe that we have free will, you know, from a very early age, um, you know, it's going to like, it's going to affect how we think about the, the matter from, from a, um, a logical, rational perspective. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I think, um, see, this, this issue, this topic of whether human will is causal, unconscious, or free is an excellent um, intelligence test because it does measure pure logic. You know, um, you know, again, so much of intelligence, if you take an, uh, an IQ test, um, a lot of intelligence tests, a lot of them focus on memory, what you've memorized, what you retained that somebody's told you, and you can kind of like restate, regurgitate. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just like very rote. It's no thinking involved. But that's not intelligence. I mean, that's kind of intelligence. That's, but, you know, I think a stronger kind of intelligence is when you can understand the logic of what you know. You know, so, so again, if you want to try to understand why so many thinkers, scientists, physicists have gotten this wrong, um, you know, believe that some things aren't caused, believe that we have a free will, then go back to the idea that, like, to, to, um, to become a physicist. You got to remember a lot of equations. You, you know, memory is very, very strong, um, and so like you have a lot, a lot of them. That that's how they, that's how they got through school. That's how they got their degrees. That's how they, that's how they operate in the world. It's not so much about thinking. It's about reciting what they've learned. Okay, and that's you know that's the way our culture is. That's how a lot of schools run you know again there is it's not i'm not saying that there's no logic taught um at all but i don't remember ever having a course in logic um in elementary school junior high school high school you know um all right so now again the, the reason why this is such a great intelligence test it, it's so simple you know um in order for us to have, I mean, 
Well, no, no. Let, let's deal with the causality part. Because, like, yeah, in order for us to have a, a free will, I'm saying it's the term is incoherent. I'm trying to say, in order for us to have a free will, what would have to happen? We would have to be in control of everything. Okay, we would have to be in control of everything that makes us decide what we do. And that would kind of like make us into a god, which we're not, you know. But, um, but okay, the test is like, if everything has a cause, again, it's so simple. If everything has a cause, every decision we make has a cause. If every decision we make has a cause, then there's a cause to that cause, and then there's a cause to that cause. And, you know, you don't have a beginning cause, okay? Like, there's a cause to our decision, there's a cause to that cause, there's a cause to that cause, there's a cause to that cause, and these causes are always going back in time. It, it's so, it's, it couldn't be more simple, okay? It couldn't be more simple. And when you apply the state of the universe explanation to this, that, um, that basically the most fundamental explanation of cause and effect, of causality, is that um, you have this one universe, this one reality, that is evolving moment by moment as we go from the past to the present to the future. It evolves. It changes. It changes. The particles change. Things move. You know, the, the state of the universe right at this moment is different than it was 10 seconds ago ago, but it was completely determined by it. And the state of the universe now at this moment is going to completely determine the state of the universe the next. All right. I think you can see how, how clear that logic is. Um, so, we, you know, that, that so many, you know, ostensibly brilliant people get this wrong. You know, you, you've got to um, appreciate the, um, the importance of both emotions and conditioning in, in, um, in how we apply logic. And also, I think it's just like, yeah, I think that, you know, some of us just, um, no, I think what I want to say is that um, logic, logic requires objectivity, okay? And that means taking yourself away from um, the situation. That means, like, for example, you know, I might feel, I don't, I guess, but I might, well, yeah, I wish I had a free will, you know, that, that I could just like be however I wanted to. But um, I might feel that I have a free will, okay? But um, because because it feels good, because it feels good to to um, you know to have that illusion, whatever. Because we do have illusions that we sometimes choose, whatever. But that's that's a different story. But that might feel good, all right? But if we're going to address this, this um, question logically, we've got to put our personal preferences aside. This is science. This is logic. This isn't like, you know, well, you know, I feel it should be the right answer, so it's the right answer. So regardless of our wanting to have a free will, whatever, um, we have to have a mind that's objective enough to overcome that per personal preference. In other words, we have to, like look at the problem, look at the situation, look at causality, what exactly causality is, what it does, how it affects our decisions, our every behavior. Objectively, clearly, rationally, logically, apart from our um, preferences, apart from how we would like reality to be. Sure, we would like for there to be a free will. We'd all be good, we'd all be completely happy. But, you know, when we, obviously, obviously we're not. Obviously, you know. <laughs> all right. Um, so this, you know, all right. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I've got some notes here. Um, this kind of like requires a new definition of sanity because it is like completely, completely insane from a, from a very technical standpoint to, um, to believe that, that we have a free will, to not understand that causality um, prohibits free will. Now, I say it's, it's like, it's, insta it's insane uh, fundamentally, but, but, you know, I, I just, as a caveat, if, if, um, if maintaining this illusion that you have a free will leads you to, 
to lead a, a better, a happier life, then, then maybe that illusion for you, for, for some of us, isn't so completely insane. It is insane because it doesn't make sense, but if it makes sense to your life, you know, again, perfect example, um, we have no idea what, um, what happens when we die, okay? Um, and there are, there are various options, either like nothing happens, we just die or nothing happens, um, we can, let's say, go to a, there, we can go to a place that's, that's completely blissful. We can go to a place that's completely uh, filled with pain and punishment. We can go to places that are like a combination. I mean, like we have absolutely no idea what happens when we die. So because of that, because there's no way of, of applying logic or reason, then if you want to hold the belief, like I hold the belief that when we die... When we all die, because no one has a free will, it would be wrong and unfair and terrible to punish anyone for anything that we had no choice but to do. So my personal belief is that when we die, we all go to a blissful place, you know, the best place. And yeah, that's, you know, I, have no abs- I have no proof about it, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, it may be an illusion, it may not, but, you know, I'm... I'm choosing this belief because it feels good, but I'm not, you know, there's no, in other words, there's no logical refutation to my belief that, um, that we go to a blissful place, you know, and again, I can't prove it, but it's a belief, but this belief in a blissful place after death is completely different from, you know, our belief that we have a free will because, you know, the fundamental nature of reality argues against free will, you know, change causality. (laughs) Okay. Um, Okay. Now, I have a feeling that this this delusion of free will that we have collectively, it's not going to last all that much longer. One, because like, you know, it's out there. I mean, the universe is like, um, you know, we do this call-in show, time for a commercial, we do, do this call-in show in Manhattan, uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, um, Channel 56, uh, every Wednesday at 11 p.m., and it's a debate show. We have people calling in. Um, my friend um, who wants to be known as the messenger <laughs> for this show, I'm the truth machine, okay? And um, we're basically, we're, we're reaching people, you know, um, this show, as a matter of fact, I'm going to do a commercial for this show. Um, I did a Google search. I, I did the search terms free will in quotes and determinism for the years 2005, 2006. How many results in Google? Okay. And just briefly, um, I'll present this perhaps on another show. Between 2000, in 2010, there were about, I think, 10,000 results. Okay. Then two, what happened in 2011? I started doing this show January 6th. So like, again, there were, the whole year of 2010, there were like 10,000 results for free will and quotes determinism. 2011, there were 27,000 results. So, so what I'm saying is, yeah, people are getting the message. There's interest. Interest in this is really um, mushrooming. And March 6th, uh, when, when Sam Harris, who's a best-selling um, author comes out with his book refuting uh, free will it's going to be even that more out there and the reason I say the free will delusion can't survive that much longer is because um, well you know our world our world is um, has challenges I mean it's not just the, the economy the global economy a much more um, much more serious, really, you know, for the decades to come, is climate change. Climate change is um, will affect all of us. In other words, like, there, are, it's 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 a kind of challenge that, you know, for example, if we here in the United States did everything that we could, but the rest of the world didn't, then that wouldn't be enough. Or if the rest of the world did what they, what they could, but we didn't, then that wouldn't be enough. Climate change is so so fundamental a challenge to our civilization that um, to the extent that we continue this belief in free will which um, which which inevitably leads to blame and guilt and competition 
I mean, with, with the blame, I mean, just uh, blame alone. Um, we don't have time for blame. We don't have time to, you know, to, to say, or, or for punishment, you know, because like what happens with the free will belief, it's like, all right, you blame someone for something that they had no choice but to do, and because of your belief in free will, because you're blaming them, you think, well, they should be punished, okay? And like the world we're moving into doesn't have time for this. And uh, even with the, with the Occupy uh, Global Revolution of 99%, for, you know, against the 1%, um, we want this to go as quickly as possible, but as peacefully and pleasantly as possible. So the way to do that is like to the extent that we overcome this illusion of free will, yeah, we'll, we'll have to take the, the power and the, and the money from the 1%, you know, uh, the inordinate power and money. I mean, because there, there's no other, you know, viable option. But we won't do it from the perspective of blaming them. It, it wasn't their fault what they did, and it's not our fault what we're doing. It's nobody's fault. So when we go through that perspective, we, we do what we have to do much more compassionately, much more intelligently. Okay, again, that's why this is, um, you know, this, this morality, this intelligence morality test that I'm, um, that I'm describing isn't just a moot point. It, it's significant. It, 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 um, it applies to our world. Okay. Um, so, yeah, what's the, the end result? Um, to the extent that people understand, people who don't understand the logic of free will being impossible, that's a great exercise in, in strengthening their lo logic. To the extent that, that we all understand that free will is impossible, our logic improves, and, and what happens? The world becomes more intelligent. You know, we, we just like, you know, we're more intelligent, more compassionate, and, and good. Okay, we got about 40 seconds left, 36. Um, okay, Myth of Free Will, um, 11 o'clock on Wednesdays, um, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Oh, and, and my book. I, I wrote a book. It's free online, okay? I mean, like, it's called Exploring the Illusion of Free Will, same as the title of the show. And if you go to Google Books, it's right there. You can, it's a PDF. You can download it onto your smartphone onto your, your, and read it anytime. Okay, that's all we have time for today. <laughs> Hope you're having a great day. And uh, we'll, I'll be back to talk more about this. Thanks.